Um, I'm going to start off with a bit of a confession. Uh, I have more content than I have time. But don't worry about that. I am as excited as you are to hear from Margaret, so I'm looking forward to hearing uh, that presentation. So we will be on time. Uh, but please provide me with just a little bit of an indulgence. Um, I'm going to share a few ideas that I think have some relevance to this conference and what it is that we all came here to speak about. Um, but I want to start off with something very personal to me. You have to understand how important Dr. Martin Luther King is not only to my country and to the world, but to my family personally. And when I found out that he spent time here and actually came to Kerala, the very first thing he did is he went to school to speak to young people, to hear from those young people. And what it was discovered is that that conversation with those young people actually awakened something inside of him that allowed him to come back to the U.S. with a greater clarity. This was back in 1959, three years before I was born. So three years before I was born, you played a role in the life that I live. And so for that, and on behalf of my family, I say, Nani, thank you very, very, very much. It is in that same spirit that I share with you these ideas. I think that above all of the information that we have, what it is really about is that we have to be disruptive. Now, I got this from a social media post, and don't worry about that. I just like the way they described it. And what it says is that disruptive means to prevent something from continuing or operating in a normal way. And in a very real sense, what I believe that we are all here to think, to contribute to, to act upon, is how might we become better disruptors with what has become far too normalized in our society. And part of the idea around this is the fact that uh, Simon Sinek, um, who some may know, uh, shared this idea of people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. And the essence of that idea is that if we're going to achieve change at a massive level, this is what Dr. King knew, then we have to discover the why behind what we do and, 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 and identify what we believe. And, and what, what he says is that if I find those who believe what I believe, then I can create from that a movement. And in a very real sense, what I believe we are all here to do is start a movement. And I am here as a preventionist. I stand proudly when I say that. And for me, that means I believe three things. First and foremost, I believe that the most effective way of addressing any problem is to prevent it before it starts. Secondly, I believe in the full engagement and empowerment of the community in both understanding the problem, but also being a part of the solution of that problem. And lastly, I believe in being guided by science in order to produce population level change. That's what we have to be about. But five years ago, my life changed dramatically. Five years ago, it changed in a way that created an awakening in me and gave me greater clarity on what it is that we do. Five years ago, my wife and I became grandparents for the first time, right? And, 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 and those of you who are grandparents, you already know what I'm about to say, because when you become a grandparent, your entire worldview changes. My, my grandchildren, my, my, my son gave me our first grandchild, and, and then 10 days later, my daughter gave birth to twins. And that's right, we went from zero to three in less than two weeks. So my life changed. As I look at that, they call me Babu. Babu is Swahili for grandfather. There's no sweeter word in the world than to hear your children say Babu, right? And, and, and so here, here's the thing. When I go to their homes and I try to identify, you know, Babu is here. 
I find out that for the life of me, I can't figure out how to get down the stairs. I can't open up a cabinet. I can't figure out how to charge my phone. And for the life of me, I don't know why you want to restrict certain areas of the home. I'm just saying. Here's the thing. In the context of this environment, who's the priority? Is it Babu? Who's the priority in the context of this environment, please? The children. Is there any doubt who the priority is in this environment? There is zero doubt who the priority is in this environment. Back in my country, not too long ago, the Drug Enforcement Administration released a report sending out a warning that there were rainbow-colored fentanyl pills that were getting into our society in a way that was targeting children. Who is the priority in our environment? I'm on a mission, and I'm here for one reason. I'm here to enlist as many of you as I can in that mission, and that mission is to refine how we think about prevention. For me, prevention is about identifying the most vulnerable in our population and identifying where they are most vulnerable. In other words, the environmental context that placed them at greatest risk. You know, like the top of the stairs is an invisible vulnerability for those children. And most importantly, how do we make prevention obvious? Because here's the deal, across the lifespan of a child's life, there are invisible vulnerabilities that need to be made blatantly obvious. And guess whose role that is? That's our job to do. And so if we're going to do that and to do that well, then we need to do things like partner. So I'm here and I'm proud to be associated with an organization like the, drug, um, the National Alliance for Drug Endangered Children. I happen to serve on their board. You heard from Scott Henderson earlier this morning. And it's because I found out that they believe what I believe. But not only them, but I'm also extraordinarily honored to be learning with and learning from extraordinary leaders like Esborn and all of those that are associated with Movendi. Why? Because they believe what I believe. And when I have an opportunity to partner with the World Federation Against Drugs and the leadership that they provide to our world and bringing communities together to think about things that aren't talked about often, it is because they believe what I believe, and not only them, but, but my good friend Mataj spoke yesterday, and he shared this idea about there's a need to build a bridge. You're responsible for this. And so I believe that that bridge is a bridge that has to be about how we think about public health and criminal justice. And that the cornerstone of that bridge has to be prevention because those of us who are here in the room, all of us in our separate ways, has a role that we need to play in accordance to making sure that we are able to come together. So this is not just a conference, this is the beginning of a movement for change if we're going to do things to protect our children. Uh, to my good friends from Kenya, Nakata. Nakata brought a whole group of folks here, and it is because they believe what we believe in doing this. And so we are here, as Dr. King mentioned, because this is a fiercely urgent now that we have to begin to contend with. In our nation, whether it's the opioid epidemic or the growing debate around legalization or the fact that there is a growing voice that is coming up trying to express hallucinogens as medication or new psychoactive substances that are coming into our communities or the emerging dangers of meth and the synthetic dangers that are associated as young people are beginning to engage in vaping and other issues. And even if I'm coming to this country and I'm thinking about the issues and the challenges that you all are facing in this country, there are urgent 
dangers that need to be made blatantly obvious in ways that we have to be about. And so part of what it is that we do in prevention and make sure that I know when I have to shut up, part of what it is that we do in prevention is that we bring science to this conversation, right? And so this is what Matash was talking about on yesterday. We understand how we help folks understand how to define those issues. How do we make sure that we identify those risk factors and protective factors so that we can understand the context of the environments that we're trying to serve? How do we then bring about a comprehensive set of strategies that have an evidence base to it so that we might be able to bring about change? But there is a fourth step that is, I believe, the most important step, and that fourth step is where we need the greatest degree of attention right now. How do we ensure that the science that we care so desperately about is spread among the people that we're trying to serve? Does that make sense to anybody here in the room? And so if we're going to do this, I think that there are a couple of things that we need to pay attention to. I'm just going to introduce a couple of ideas and then I'll be out of your way. First is how do we communicate clearly the importance of what it is that we believe. I'm going to introduce a couple of slides with some data on it. This is representing the United States, but I just want to introduce the idea. What you see here are you see the percentage of high school seniors, right? So these are 12th grade students who reported past month substance misuse, right? From mid-70s all the way up through today, and I don't mind the different colors, they represent different substances. What I want you to pay attention to is the trend line. The trend is going in an extraordinarily positive direction. In other words, what we are seeing is that there is some extraordinary progress that we are making in protecting the young people in the country as it relates to this. When you look at it from the other side, these are all the high school seniors in the U.S. that reported they didn't use any substance in the past 30 days, right? Now look at that trend line. It is going in a positive direction, an extraordinary positive direction. The point that I'm trying to make here with these two slides is that the thing that we now can say with clarity is that prevention works. Prevention is part of what contributed to this taking place and becoming the norm. And if, we don't, if you don't remember anything else that I say, what we want to make sure we're doing is making sure that those trend lines keep going in that direction. Does that make sense to anybody here in the room? And so one of the ways in which we've been able to secure that is because we have adopted the process and the policy of the strategic prevention framework in the United States. We've actually put resources behind trying to ensure that every community has a framework by which they can think about being clear about what prevention is for their communities. And so we have a way of making sure that everybody is on the same page. But if we're going to do that well, what I offer to you is that we can help our communities by prioritizing, making sure that we're clear in what it is that we're saying, that making sure that we're focusing locally and making sure that we're able to concretize what it is that we're talking about, defining our strategic leverage by strategizing and ensuring that we are able to engage effectively and equitably across our communities. If we're going to make science matter, I believe that there are things that we can do in order to produce that change. And then lastly, a couple of things. There are some opportunities for us to begin to think about some of this. Some of the data that I'm going to be presenting, actually all the data that I'm going to be presenting has been provided by some extraordinary heroes of mine, Dr. Bertha Madras, Dr. Robert DuPont, and Dr. Caroline DuPont, did some remarkable work in trying to help us to understand this issue better when it comes to our young people. They, went through the, um, uh, the data that we have in our nation and they asked two succinct questions. The first question they asked is, is the use of one substance by adolescents associated with the increased risk of using any other substance regardless of sequence? And then they asked the second part of that question, the inverse of that question, is non-use of one substance associated with the decrease 
increased risk of using other substances. Let me just share with you quickly a couple of things that were staggering to me. So I'm going to just explain this, and if you understand how to look at the one slide, you'll understand how to look at the others. This is past month alcohol misuse and associated with the risk of using other drugs by young people ages 12 through 17. And what you see here, the different colors, you see marijuana, other illicit drugs, and cigarettes. On the left side, well, your right side, I believe, on your right side, you will note that when the young people said, yes, I used alcohol, yes, I binge drink, yes, I had heavy alcohol misuse, you can see the associated use of other substances, cigarettes and other illicit drugs, marijuana, right? Where they said, no, I was not using alcohol in the past 30 days, you can see the dramatic decrease in their use of other substances. And the same as holds true when they talked about marijuana, where they said yes, you can see their associated risk of misusing other substances, where they said no, the statistics of it is at a nominal fashion. And this impacted us in our nation so much that the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Service Administration, which has the authority of collecting all the data on behalf of the country, changed the way they look at data now. And now they are now reporting in the same manner. So here you see the red represents no past um, month alcohol use, the blue represents um, uh, past month alcohol use but not heavy use, and the green represents past month heavy alcohol misuse. All this is sharing with you is that the greater the use or misuse of the substance, the greater the likelihood and participation it was, whether it was marijuana misuse, opioid misuse, cocaine misuse, or even as it relates to major depressive episodes and other uh, serious mental incidents. And so these are just one of the ways in which we can share with you that the big issue that I want to provide you is that, the, that we are not in any singular substance crisis that we're addressing, but rather this is a polysubstance crisis that we are having to address and that we ought to prioritize. And so part of what it is that I want to share with you is that one of the resources that we have, one of the resources that we have, Dr. DuPont, and the Institute for Behavior and Health provides what I would suggest is kind of a standard that can be offered regardless of where you are and how you are and what you do. And that standard is referred to as one choice. And one choice is setting the clear goal of dr youth drug prevention as no use of any alcohol, nicotine, marijuana, or other drugs for reasons of health. And if we use that as a standard, it can be a guiding light for us as we begin to believe, think about strategies that we might be able to employ. And so with respect to that, how many of you recognize that a guy in a suit and tie is probably not the best communicator when it comes to bringing that to our young people, right? How many of you are with me with understanding that the best communicators of this ought to be our young people, right? So if we're going to do this, here's what I want to share with you. It is the youth voice that is important. And if we're going to do that, I would suggest to you that the most effective um, 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 a group of young people that I've had the privilege of working with and seeing in action is right here at, 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 at Project Venda and, and the So Why I Engage young people that I had the opportunity and the privilege of speaking with and speaking to. I am telling you they are incredible and can provide a bit of a model for other communities and other countries even to pay attention to. Extraordinary in what it is that they're able to do. Last points that I'm going to make. If we're going to do this, we have to do this equitably. And I'll share with you that part of what it is that we are looking at 
is many of us are familiar with this river story, the story of two people standing on the bank of a river and they're fishing and they see in the middle of the river a child that's drowning. And so one of them throws down their fishing pole and they jump into the water, they swim out, they bring that child, they bring him to the, surf, uh, to the shore and they call a very expensive ambulance to nurse that child to health. The next day they come back and this time there are two drowning in the same place. They jump into the water, they swim out, they bring those two children to the shore. They call two very expensive ambulances to nurse those children back to health. The next day they come back and then there are 12. The next day they come back and then there are twice as many. And it's not until they decide that they're gonna go upstream and find out why are they falling into the river in the first place and begin to work to make sure that they're preventing young people from falling into the river in the first place. This has been the message of pre prevention for as long as I've been a part of prevention. But how many of you will recognize that while we have been focused on that, there are still those that are downstream needing some help. And what we have to do and what we have to figure out is how are we able to ensure that if those folks are downstream consistently, why are they downstream and how can we begin to be, provide them with additional help? This is all based on the fact that health is a social construction. Health is socially constructed. We, this is why the social determinants of health are so vitally important for us. And so I use this um, illustration simply to suggest that while we all might be in the same river, we're not all in the same boat. And what we need to do is we need to be able to understand and clarify how as preventionists we can become more thoughtful and directive in making sure that our young people understand their role in guiding us by ensuring that, and this is my, 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 my son helped me to think about this in this way. He radically changed the way I view equity. He shared with me that the way to engage young people around the idea of equity is by understanding that equity equals belonging to them. And if we're able to ensure that our young people are belonging, understand that they have a sense of dignity, making sure that we're paying attention to their sense of justice, then they can provide the guidance for us about how we might be able to bring science to our population in a way that can be effective. And so, don't worry about me skipping slides. Everyone in this room in one shape, form, or fashion can find themselves in this continuum of care. Our role and our job is to make sure that we are building bridges between that continuum in ways that matter for our children. And so I refer to this as getting into good trouble and a few ideas for us to be able to get into some good trouble. We can help prevent the use of any and all drug use with adolescents by promoting a one choice campaign. We can make sure that we're helping our young people understand how to challenge the myths and educate their relationship and realities of commercialized poly substance misuse. We can make sure that we're monitoring for inequities and exposure and opportunities and the disparities in their outcomes and applying pressures and questionable strategies so that we might be able to ensure that we are engaging equitably. Most importantly, we can take on the responsibility of making prevention obvious by becoming disruptive in what it is that we do. And so on behalf of my grandson and the twins, that's Valentina, that's Carmen, this is what they look like. Whether it's my children, or whether it's yours, this is about making our world a better place because they matter. God bless you. Thank you very, very much for your time.